Birmingham is the largest city economy in the UK outside of London and a key driver of growth in the West Midlands. While we've seen the huge benefits that come with growth and development, now we have an opportunity to ensure gains arising from future development are more evenly spread. We will continue to welcome inward investment for our city while creating opportunities for major developments such as new homes and workplaces for our people. Alongside this, we will create further leisure, cultural and social infrastructure across central Birmingham. Throughout, we will focus on green and sustainable growth. Our City of Growth aims for 2040 include meeting growing provision for jobs, skills and opportunities for all in our community. Ensuring that the social, environmental and economic benefits of development and growth have a positive impact on everyone across our city. Strengthening our global position as an attractive place for inward investment and a first choice location for a variety of businesses. Taking a zero carbon approach to development. Working towards circular economy principles. Maximizing the benefits of our unique qualities of diversity and identity, heritage, heroes, leisure, arts and culture to boost our visitor economy. Thank you so much for joining this final event of the Our Future City Conversations, which are designed to support feedback to our future city plan engagement led by Birmingham City Council. Um, if you haven't already, please do take uh, part in the engagement and ensure that you have your say by clicking on the Be Heard link, which you'll find in the post. It's really lovely to um, connect with you all. My name is Amara Spence. I'm a spatial practitioner, an artist and a systems designer. Um, and in my work um, through art and social justice organization Maya or with the Black Land and Spatial Justice Project, I'm very interested in infrastructure. I'm interested in regenerative economics. I'm interested in narrative and fundamentally how the imaginations of local people are resourced and amplified. It's an honor to be here today hosting this conversation, creating an equitable city. Um, and because we're speaking about equity, which is something that I'm really passionate about, I really wanted to anchor this conversation with some words from the great Angela Davis, um, who said that you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world and you have to do it all the time. And I just wanna sit with that for a moment. I think there are a lot of wisdoms that we're going to draw upon today in the conversation. There's a lot of wisdoms that we'll hear from. Um, and of course, we know that there are so many other people in and across the city who have got lots of things to say and are really passionate about equity. Please connect with what the Birmingham City Council are doing um, with the Our Future City uh, project. Um, I am really pleased to be joined by some exquisite friends and colleagues. Um, and I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves, um, but I just want to give a sort of precursor. So we have the wonderful uh, Colette McCann, we have um, Andre Reed, we have Bob Josh, and then we have uh, Sue Manns. Um, and Colette, I would love if we could hear from you in the first instance. Um, who are you? Tell us a bit about your work and particularly what equity means to you. Um, hi everyone, uh, I'm Colette McCann, I am the Head of Housing Development at the City Council, um, streaming to you from the sunny Kings Heath Riviera this morning, <laughs> which is a lovely change. Um, primarily my role really focuses on developing um, and delivering affordable homes for the city. Um, I work within um, the Birmingham Municipal Housing Trust, BMHT, although the the, the title suggests it's a trust, it's not, it's just the branding that we use for the council's new homes. So we've been delivering homes across the city for the last 10, just over 10 years now, delivered over 3,000 new homes. For the majority, for our, some of our most vulnerable um, families in the city, our focus really is on providing well-designed um, homes that are energy efficient, that meet the needs of, uh, varying needs of our communities, um, that you know that that's kind of been our bread and butter over the, the last sort of 10 years and our focus really 
I think moving forward is how we can accelerate that level of affordable housing delivery. Um, particularly as well responding to um, the route to zero, which is the, the City Council's response to uh, climate change. So a commitment there to increase the energy efficiency of our, of our homes, um, to reduce uh, fuel poverty, to um, sort of eke out that heat or eat mentality that I think a lot of our, our very vulnerable um, citizens really suffer from. Um, that, that's one of the key drivers for the, for the team at the moment to look at how we can develop um, our housing types to meet, uh, meet that challenge, to look at how we um, really embed the developments that are coming forward uh, with access to great, um, great, greatly designed and really well managed green space that's available. I think that's become really pertinent over the last 12 months, how there is a real disparity across the city about the quality of open space that is available to our communities. And I think that, that's really sort of very high on our agenda, linking into some of the, the other work streams, accelerator programme, really focusing on green space um, and, and the environment that our homes sit in. So that's sort of a whistle stop tour of house building <laughs> from the city's perspective. And I'm sure we're going to draw on more of your wisdom and a, a, a bit more of a, a whistle, a whistle stop tour um, in our time together. And I think you've touched on some really important points already that there can be no equity without climate justice feels like a really strong um, thread as well. So thank you so much for sharing. Andre Reid. Um, hey, Amara. Nice to see you again. Hi. Nice to see everyone in the room as well. Um, my name's Andre. Um, I'm a designer, um, architectural um designer based in Warsaw, um, just outside of Birmingham. Um, and I, I'm the director of a um, design research practice called Kiondo, um, which is all about bringing communities together to really look at the question, um, how might we get to decide what our cities look and feel like, and bring people together um, to create positive change with that intention that it will be passed down to future generations. Um, a lot of my practice has really been around how we um, empower communities to be part of those conversations around how cities work and also encourage them to take up the mantle of um, and that pride in their place and work towards those changes themselves. So we do a lot of work around weaving partnerships with other organizations in Warsaw at the moment. We're weaving those, those partnerships between the local authority and some of the bigger employers and I guess statutory bodies that exist in the town so that they can support the activities of local people more um, connectedly. And then we're also looking at the leadership agenda in terms of how we um, develop leadership in these spaces and encourage the curious minds to actually take hold of this work for the long term. So as a design company, actually, actually we focus more on people and place than actual the design of, project, of products and creating things. Um, we've used the phrase at this moment in time that our ability to create is matched by our ability to destroy. And with that kind of impetus, like looking at that, it, the world at that, from that perspective, it's not just about creating beautiful and amazing things. Actually, it's about being really conscious about how we create in the world and the impacts it has on our environment and, and on, our, on our planets and our communities. So um, Kiondo are taking that approach over the next five years um, to look at that in Warsaw and to really develop that infrastructure in neighboring towns and make it, make it a place that's more connected to cities like Birmingham and Wolverhampton um, and places where people can really live and thrive. Thank you so much. And there are already beautiful patterns that are emerging in the conversation. So I know it's gonna be rich. Um, Bob Ghosh, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And I'm very pleased to, to take part in this uh, panel discussion. So uh, I'm, I'm the founder and director of K4 Architects. So we're a, a small independent practice based in Digbeth. And we've, uh, we've been going for 10 years and we, we've managed to specialize in some really uh, interesting and complex urban regeneration projects. So at the moment, our focus is in and around Digbeth next to HS2. And we're working on some really interesting things around there, uh, which, which includes homes, workspaces, uh, and also space for the, the film and media industry. So, so that, that's very exciting. Um, apart from my role at K4, I'm also a professional examiner at London South Bank University and Birmingham City University. So that's um, examining final year students as they enter the profession. Um, I'm also 
chair of Eastside Projects, which is a visual arts organisation, again, based in Digbeth. But their, their agenda, I've, I've actually learned a lot from the way they operate, uh, and, and their agenda is to uh, try and outreach as much as they can to communities who don't normally sort of have any association with the city centre or the, the, the cultural scene within the city centre. So their, their model is more about outreach into hard to reach communities, uh, with, which is uh, a brilliant tool for engagement. So even in the regeneration work that we do, uh, we, we, hope, we hope to work with these side projects to, to try and um, break down some of the barriers uh, that, that exist at the moment in our city. Thank you so much for, for sharing that um, rich experience and the many hats that you also wear. And I'm sure that's something that's going to um, resonate with lots of people listening, but also probably everyone in this conversation. So thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, Sue Mans, how are you? You're on mute, Bab. I'm sorry to do that. <laughs> it's, it's become the phrase of my... <laughs> my at some point today. Thank you oh. for starting us off, Sue. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this, and it's wonderful to join the other speakers that you've got, and I'm just so impressed with the gathering that, uh, that you've got. So I'm Sue Manns, and I'm a Chartered Town Planner, and I, was, I had the honour of being the President of the Royal Town Planning Institute last year, which of course was Covid year. So the phrase on mute really came to mean <laughs> something to me during Covid year. But what being president of the RTPI gave me was the most incredible platform to promote something which I am very, very passionate about, and which has been the golden thread throughout my career. And that is effective community engagement, diverse, equal and inclusive, effective community engagement. And that I can tell I'm just really, really passionate about it. And it actually goes back to the very start of my career. And I will say, um, I'm passionate about Birmingham. My family, I remember visiting my great grandparents up Broad Street uh, back in the day. And there's lots of pictures I see of my family around in Birmingham. So I started my career at Birmingham City Council. And I put in the planning application for the convention centre which I am so proud of, and all the things that happened around it. I was involved in a lot of the city centre projects that were going on at the time. But what really jumped out to me as that was we were not engaging the local communities when we were doing those projects and something needed to change it. It was, they were great projects, but it was being done to the community, not with, not part of, but we did find ways of doing as the best we could, but it really sparked my interest in community engagement. Then I went off to uh, BCU and became a lecturer in planning law and practice. And hey presto, my research was focused on community engagement, public speaking at planning committees, which was something I was very interested in. Um, I then went on through other things. I've worked at regional level, national level, public, private sector, but that golden thread has gone all the way through. And then about 10 years ago, I got the opportunity to apply for the most amazing role, which was national planner for the Royal Town Planning Institute's Planning Aid England. Now that gave me the most incredible and powerful platform to actually talk about effective community engagement, to write, to convince government, to convince major developers, all of those people to come together. And it actually makes sense to bring your community with you. But when you do it, don't just listen to those few try and engage with the many. Because the one thing I would say is that it is simply not possible for one group of people from similar backgrounds to have all the insights that we need to be able to make informed decisions about our future. So from there, back to the, uh, back to the private sector and then uh, on to being um, president of the RTBI. So this year it's immediate past president and absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Sue. What an extraordinary year you probably had. <laughs> not, not the one I thought. <laughs> not the one you thought, I guess not, not the one that any of us imagined. And that's something that, you know, it feels impossible to have a conversation about equity without thinking about the year of 2020 and those impacts. And I say the year of 2020 because yes, of course, we know the impacts of COVID-19, but also we were having a conversation like never before about race in the UK. We were having a conversation never before about um, the public realm and race. And, and I think it's really important that all of you in some degree have kind of touched on this role of the, 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 import, the importance of people in place, the importance of community in neighborhoods, the importance of community in their places. 
And this is something that I'd really like to touch on. In many ways, it feels like we know that, you know, COVID has exacerbated the challenges that we all knew were there before, you know, some of us knew to a greater degree what that meant and how that applied in different people's lives, but it has absolutely exacerbated what we knew was there. And I'm really curious in your own sort of, um, from your own perspectives, what are some of your observations in the communities that you're working with, in, in, in maybe in your own neighborhoods, how has that sort of affected how your neighborhoods and communities are together? Anyone has any thoughts or reflections? Do you want me to kick off on oh, that? Please, please. <laughs> I think what we've seen are the strengths and weaknesses of communities. Some, the way communities have actually, uh, particularly in the first lockdown, came together to support people was quite quite remarkable. They knew exactly how where to go to get who were the vulnerable people, how to put in place support networks. But it also showed the weaknesses of our places and spaces. It showed the inequity. It showed who was being hit hardest. It was, it was very, very unequal in terms of its impact. But it also made us think about um, local lives. We had to live our lives locally and that focused on housing. And is the housing suitable for that? Who was suffering from the uh, small properties where they couldn't work at home, all of those sorts of things? Who didn't have outside space? So it's, it's very unequitable. I think it's an awful lot of lessons that we can actually learn from that. So I'll let the others jump in. <laughs> oh, Andre, I'm gonna have to do it to you now. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I've been muted. Sorry, I wanna jump in there because that's exactly what we've been seeing as well. Um, people need to reconfigure their spaces and find new spaces, um, especially around the home where we've been working much closer to home. We've started to really acknowledge um, the design of our spaces and, and question is a living room really a living room is a kitchen really a kitchen is the bedroom really a bedroom um, and how do we start to integrate some of the services and kind of practices that we outsource and of, of obviously go to other spaces for into the home um, you do see that disparity between people's access to public space and to open space and how that impacts on um, individual well-being and also just the opportunity to access other spaces, even if you don't own them, how that impacts on our well-beings as well. So um, one of the things that we've really identified um, over the last, I'd say, six to eight months is um, it also correlates with what you said, Sue, in terms of the disparity. Um, I, see, I see that division actually between those that have the opportunity to provide and support communities and those communities that are just trying to self-organize and often having to really not, I, I hate the word beg, but also like really scream for support from, um, from those around them. Um, and it's one of the things that has kind of mobilized people to act, um, to kind of create groups and self-organize and, and do things themselves. But also because of that, it's, you've kind of got the larger organizations and the larger bodies sitting still saying, well, actually they're already doing it. So do they really need us? Do we really need to impact our bottom, bottom line if communities can sort themselves out? So there is really a challenge in terms of really addressing how we work as communities rather than looking at community as an external element. We're all part of an ecosystem here. So we have to start looking at that and addressing it going forward. Yeah, if I could just come in on that, Andre. That's really that's a really interesting point about how um, local communities and local people have really mobilised. And I think some of the discussion that we've had within the city council is how we support those local small local businesses, local communities to access some of the opportunities around commissioned services, commissioned um, contracts that the city is is looking to procure all the time. How do we energise? How do we upskill? those local community groups and, and small businesses to be able to um, seek out those opportunities. Because if we've got uh, local services being delivered by those people, uh, by local people, surely that is the best outcome for everyone. You know, we, we're having really specific directed services delivered and supported by local people and the local economy. That's, that would be, you know, the utopia, wouldn't it? I think that that's a real key point. I think one of the other things that has really become quite um, quite clear over the last twelve months is the digital inequity as well across the city. I think that's been that's been quite that's really come to the fore. In particular, looking at, at especially kids that don't have access to be able to do the the, the schoolwork they've needed to from home. Um, I think the 
the real stark reality of one in four of our young people being unemployed, coming out of school, coming out of university, and just coming into this, this huge um, uh, lack of opportunity for them, that's really become quite obvious. And I think how we start to think about supporting young people through that pathway from education into employment or further education, that I think as well, it, it has become quite obvious over the last 12 months. And I, I think the, the way I've uh, observed uh, things in, in the last 12 to 14 months is that I think that there's been a real shift in terms of the perception of, of cities in general and the, the purpose of a city. So if, I think people are, are really questioning uh, you know, what, what is the function of a city centre, what is the function of certain sectors within that. So, for example, entertainment, um, the arts uh, and uh, any uh, cultural um, attractions of a city. So, so I think that there's um, there's people who have are very um, have suffered really badly and are quite sort of disengaged. Uh, whereas uh, there's others who've who've done very well uh, from from uh, the last uh, twelve months. And I think the um, inequity that, that that's created is quite um, is quite obvious, but. Um, it does also create um, an opportunity in the sense that if let's say the, the city centre of Birmingham is, is now less um, relevant to people, then does that give an opportunity for the suburban local centres to take on uh, a new function, new importance and be elevated um, within, within the, the sort of psyche of the city? Because um, I, th I think that's where, uh, I can see some kind of a positive legacy coming out of this, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying abandon city centres like like they they did in America, but um, I think repurpose city centres, but then re-energise the local centres. I think that that's definitely something that uh, we should encourage. Yeah. I think I'm going to, as a point. Definitely. I think that's a really good opportunity. Um, and I think one of the things we've, we're really interested in is how we mobilize that very quickly as well. Um, like, how do you get people to actually access space and change the use and start to experiment? I think most councils and local authorities are risk averse. So how do you actually start to, to, to de develop those changes um, over a period of time, rather than it just being the idea that an external set of people with the capital will come in and make those suggestions. How do we collaborate and um, bring people into it more than engagement? I mean, actually, the participation is long term, um, not just a questioning exercise and a consultation or a website link to say, how do you feel about this change that's coming, but really get people that already want to do the change to be part of that process. Because I, I see that as well, like the city centres are, are completely different now, they're completely different, but people still need spaces for joy, they still need spaces to come together. Um, and they are, we're in a pl place right now where that imagination, that imagining people have been doing over the months whilst they've been locked in their homes. And it's a great opportunity to like to use the space as an opportunity to test those ideas out. And I want to come to something that you both said there, um, Bob and Andre, this um, Birmingham historically has been really centralised. Sue, I know you touched on it earlier, it, that infrastructure is really centralised, so therefore how resources flow has been really centralised. And I'm really interested, this long term, you know, a landscape that you're talking about, Andre, let's not forget that before the last year, a lot of people were organising and were trying to mobilise quickly and were being told that they couldn't mobilize at the speed of say the private sector they couldn't get their things together in time because you know there's there's somebody else and i think we're at this moment of reckoning as a city where we can really look back and say what do we actually want to be what do we want to stand for who do we want to be in the world and how do we want to connect with other people in that journey because that fundamentally has to be the approach and i really appreciate what you started to talk about there bob was about um the decentralization for me, this is what I get um, when I was invited to host this conversation. One of the th first things that I heard was about this being that the sort of new approach was about decentralizing infrastructure, resources, energy, where we know that there have been, you know, whole communities of people who have the ideas, they have the passion, they even have the skills to build the things that they want to build, to see what they want to see in their neighborhoods. They haven't had the resources. 
they haven't had the investment, they haven't been given the time granted to make those things um, uh, real in the world. Um, and it feels like I really appreciate this point of, um, we understand that geography therefore determines prospects, it determines outcome, it determines what's possible so far. So how are we imagining the future of our geography? How are we imagining Birmingham? What do we want to stand for? And what is needed in our neighbourhoods? I'd love to pose that to each of you. Do you mind if I, if I start? Because uh, I think it was um, really interesting the way that this discussion is evolving because the whole concept of decentralization needs to be engineered in a sense because there's a natural gravity towards uh, investment in the city center uh, where you've got the, the concentration of employment and transportation, for example. However, I think the, the most interesting thing within the draft uh, our city plan um, document was, was not, not about the 50 storey towers that can go next to HS2, but it's about the idea of breaking through the middle way. So you don't get this cliff edge on the edge of the city core, and then you get this sort of extreme uh, wealth and then extreme sort of deprivation. So, so that, that is probably the single most significant um, move that the city can make by uh, breaking through that. And, and so, so it's not all about the city centre, it's about Small Heath, it's about Borders Green, it's about Neutrals. So, so it dissolves those artificial edges, which has just been created by a bit of 1960s infrastructure. So, so I, think, I think there's a big opportunity there. Um, go ahead, Andrew. Sue, go ahead. I saw oh. you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up, if I can, and link together a few of the themes that, on the question, but also uh, something Colette said about digital exclusion. And the thing I'd pick up on that is those who are digitally excluded are the same people we are failing to reach when we do traditional consultation. So it's, it's a sort of double whammy there. We've really got to address that. But just picking up what Bob said and about the, the middle way and taking a step back before I sort of say any more. We didn't have any notice of COVID. We had no idea it was going to come other than possibly a month or so you saw it building across the world. Climate change, we know that's happening. We know we've had ample notice of it and those who are going to be impacted by climate change are very much the same people who've been most impacted by COVID. So the solutions, as Bob was saying, and you were saying, Mara, about that this is the tipping point. This is the time when we've got to, sub, to, to recognize we aren't just dealing with the, the learning from COVID, but we also need to plan in how we're going to tackle this and, and prevent the same things, history repeating itself with climate change. So picking up Bob's point about the, the middle way, I actually really like the 15 minute neighborhood this is something that has been talked about so much uh, in the planning profession over the last year. And it's something that really connects with COVID and it really connects with climate change, hence the, the thing I was trying to bring together. And um, Paris has been one of the leaders on that. But I think that is a key way about reinvigorating, giving identity to, supporting those local areas and breaking down those barriers that uh, we talked about. So that, that would be mine. <laughs> I love what you said there. Um... I've got a few provocations, probably more than anything, because this conversation has just got me questioning loads of different things. And one of the first things is if we were to have those 15 minute neighborhoods and distribute um, all of this wealth and investment and the way that we organize the city, how would we organize it politically? Because design is inherently political. And the way that we actually organize resources and create spaces, it needs to be administrated in some way or form and organized. So I feel like that's one of the challenge areas that we need to really address as well, which is these smaller collect spaces and neighborhoods. How do we shift it from just being, um, I don't know, the middle class of that area influencing how that space looks and feels? How do we get that to be more equitable in those places? Um, and what models exist around the world <coughs> which demonstrate that? Um, the other one is in terms of like design being completely political as well. And I, I completely believe this because it shapes what we call like the cultural prism, which we live in. So when you do design spaces and places, you say this is a school, you say this is an institution, you create the framework for which people design their lives. Um, 
this is an opportunity to redefine those. What are the new institutions of the future in a distributed neighborhood, um, distributed city, sorry. Um, what does that look like? You've touched on a lot there, um, both of you. And for me, I always get like the 15 minute city when I first started reading about that, um, I was really excited and then I got really nervous. How within that context are we still not gonna re recreate the same patterns of inequity? We already have 15 minute neighborhoods and actually they're still socially isolated. They're still disconnected from resources. They exist already. So how, and you know, we've got to talk about travel infrastructure and all these other things in order to talk about that, because right now in Birmingham, we have inequitable public transport, we have disconnect there. So what is it then to design things that are supposed to be, you know, positive, things that are supposed to, you know, support climate justice and, and, and healthy space that are supposed to support um, healthy financial structures and that flow. But if we're not careful, we can then mirror some of those same patterns. Um, and we're seeing, you know, I can imagine a lot of the, the clean air zone sort of um, feedback, while we might really be for it for, um, for, for climate purposes and for, and for clean air, what does that mean for people who now cannot afford to physically access the city centre? Some of those people work within the city centre. And yes, there might be sort of things in place to support that. But are we, are we not? you know, creating some forms of inequity there. Colette, I wonder if you have any reflections on that. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, sort of pondering over the, the concept of the 15 minute uh, neighborhood. And I think really it comes down to what, what, what is it that that neighborhood needs? And that might be very different and it, and it might change across the city within neighborhoods. So it's not that you, it, there's a blueprint to what that neighborhood means or needs. That, that enables it to access for, for the community there to access its, the support that's required. I think as well when we talk about uh, particularly transportation and infrastructure, that's uh, I think it's really key for us to be able to move around neighbourhoods as well, not just to be able to travel into the city centre and out. It's being able to have that that ability to move move from neighbourhood to neighbourhood rather than just that pure focus on. Um, into the city centre and back out again. I think um, those are the kind of the, the key things that I was I was sort of pondering over then as we sort of discussed around those 15 minute neighbourhoods. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm really interested, Andre, you've touched on this, the sort of the new institutions within within neighbourhoods. What are the new things that we want to see? Like we've been developing um, plans for an artist-led hotel. And the second that we, we had that concept, we knew we didn't want it to be in the city centre. We knew that there was a need for, for this type of infrastructure, social infrastructure that was well-resourced, that was world-class in a neighbourhood that, that doesn't get investment, that, do, that doesn't get love. And as part of that, um, as part of that proposal, we we took on a house at Port Loop in Ladywood, um, and we've turned it into an art house and residency space. And essentially, like you know, an art house is kind of like a moniker to do all the other stuff. Like we, we've become like you know a library, we've become a community kitchen, we've become all of these things. And we know in neighbourhoods, the independent places, the independent hubs, become a million and one things. You might set out to be a food shop and then you become like a taxi rank, a chemist, you know, all of these other things. And we see that a lot in, in neighborhoods. So I'd, I'm curious from, from all of you really, what are the new institutions, the new spaces, the new hubs that you really want to see emerge within neighborhoods? So I wanna to touch on that a little bit as well. It might expand the scope of this question. <laughs> Hopefully not too much, but um, it does something about, Oh gosh, hopefully I don't lose this point because it's just floating right here. Um, there's something about the new institutions and what is it in terms of how these spaces, like the things that you're setting up, Amara, and other people are setting up in um, kind of areas outside of the city, wherever it is. Um, I see it as a way of we all outsource space. So we're actually just looking for other spaces to be in all the time. I think this is us as human beings um, looking for things that we can't put in our homes because we haven't designed homes to hold those spaces. But more than that, it's about how we, I, I, um, my personal belief is, how, your belief is how the city is kind of disenchanted, the rituals and the cultures of being together and how we actually look to, we need to redefine and create those spaces where we can come together and perform those rituals that traditionally when we were in smaller communities, we would do so naturally. Um, 
And so we naturally, you, the government might decide, oh, we do community centers again and come up with a framework, but that doesn't necessarily work because it's not community led. And communities lead, are able to better lead on designing those spaces because they know what they want. They know what cultures and, sh and, and, and things, that, activities they want to do as groups, as, as families that come together. Um, so really when I think about the spaces of the future, what that means is like being able to come up with new names for things, an art hotel, like where you don't see that in the world. Can we create new things, new um, combinations of ideas? coming together that fit the purpose for that area, for that specific geographical location. Um, we're doing a similar thing, but we are doing it in the town center of Warsaw. But the, on, the reason why we're doing it at that specific point is because it's the most impoverished area of the entire town center. It's, it's dealt with so much robins, um, um, drug use, um, low employment, and it's actually the central node in which all the homeless literally um, um, go towards because that's the point in which people are seeking the help and support so it's really about investing in these really specific areas which you can see they're vulnerable but it's not a matter of there's a savior complex actually it's about rooting yourself in those spaces and really caring and being part of that investing in the future of mm -hmm. those places and how they're defined yeah i think the uh, one of the points andre made was about the the politics of uh regeneration or the politi politics of uh, development and I, and I think the the concept of a 15 minute neighborhood that that is a, a very attractive proposition but it, it could also be a, a a signal for gentrification and and I think we've got to be really cautious about that because um, some some of the decisions that have been made um, even in the last few years sort of point to the fact that you do get this um, in a, inequality, like the, the new train line that's going on the old Mosley line stops in Mosley and King's Heath, but it doesn't stop in Balsall Heath, which is probably the, the place that needs that investment more than any of the other places along that line. So, so I think that we need to face up to these realities that there needs to be better connectivity, better, um, be, better, in, uh, well, you know, higher amounts of investment in in buildings, in spaces, to create opportunities for people where, where they don't exist at the moment or where uh, people are limited by their surroundings. So we, we've got an enormous opportunity here to, to try and equalize that. And you know, I, I think Port Loop's a really interesting one because um, you know, it, it's, it's in an area that was neglected for so long, um, it probably had the lowest house prices uh, that Winston Green area of, of any any part of that, that the city centre so or, or that part of the city but I think with some really intelligent moves it has become um, something totally different and and it is a bit of a destination uh, but it doesn't feel as though it's an alien sort of gentrified piece of real estate like you get in some other areas so I think it it, it can engage well with what's around it and, and obviously you've got the the canal link as well so uh, i think we need more of those examples uh where, that are really carefully thought about uh, and and that that will help to um increase the the opportunity of those areas Hi, if i can just sort of come in on that i think there's a lot of really interesting points uh, points on that but one thing i'd like to say and it goes back to the equity theme is that we don't all start from the same place and i love the example you gave of how you set something up and people came in because actually not one of us knows how to effectively reach people who aren't like us we just don't we know our own social groups so we have to connect with those with people who then lead us to other people and so on and that sounds very much like what was happening in the center that you're, you're describing Mara and it takes time to actually do that as we start to get to know people then those doors open and it gives us a route into someone else and one of the examples I'd give was um, an amazing route into the life of people with learning difficulties and how they experience their environment. Now, how often do we actually ask people with learning difficulties or people who are with them about how they use the local environment or people with dementia? 
and yet they live local, move local. It's so important to them. But it's it's through that sort of listening, building trust, reaching out that we start to um, effectively connect with people who aren't like us. And that's where we really learn about what makes a city, because what's good for someone, for example, with dementia, where you've got streets that are marked out with corners, identifiable points, so they can find their way around. It's actually good for everybody. But if we hadn't reached out, we wouldn't know, and we wouldn't build it in. That definitely, to me, speaks to a broader point about, you know, centering on those who are most marginalised by the systems that are fundamentally benefits everyone. It's why the conversation about race was so important. It's why the conversation about disability justice is so important. It's why the conversation about child-led cities are so important. If we don't center on those people, you know, if we do center on those people, everyone benefits. If we don't, it causes mass amounts of harm for generations. So thank you for, for sharing that. Colette, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to, to come in on then. Yeah, I was just going to pick up on the, the point that Andre was raising around um, uh, the provision of new space and, and how do we go how do we go about um, uh, considering the, the design and the delivery and the development of that space. And I think really when you look back at some of the sort of 1960s estates where um, you've got a row of shops with some flats above and that was it, plonked in the middle, there you go, there's your community centre. And I think really what we've kind of learned um, and are still learning is around that flexibility of space, that that space needs to be able to change and adapt as, as, the, as the community needs change and adapt, as, as sometimes as the community changes. Um, and I think as well, what's really important is that that design is community led, that also we start to think about the stewardship of those buildings, that, that they're not necessarily uh, a municipal resource, that they are a resource for the community. And we need to look at other delivery mechanisms that allow the community to take ownership and to manage that resource moving forward. I think that's that's um, that's a place that we really need to move to when we start to look at, at developing those sort of community spaces within wider developments. And I think just picking up on Sue's point around, um, well, we fall into the trap, I think, when we look to engage with communities, is not looking at what is already there, what existing community groups there are, what um, ha, you know the, the scale of, of, of those different communities within communities and we start to reinvent an approach to engagement when actually the, the people there the people that we need to listen to are already there and are already doing fantastic work and think that's something that we need to be really mindful of that we don't create this huge engagement strategy that completely neglects the fact that there is wonderful stuff being delivered by amazing people in those communities and it erases the work, you know, it, to create a whole new strategy, it totally erases the labour that has gone on to, to make those things real in the world. Colette, you touched on a point there that I think I, I really wanted to, to come back to something that you said, Bob, about Port Loop. Because for me, and, and it's a conversation I think me and Andre have had previously, it's not the buildings, for example, are one part of the narrative. What makes the, what makes a place special? What makes, you know, communities empowered? It's the memories that you hold within those spaces. It's the stories and the narratives that, that are around that. The, the buildings then are, are sort of like a, a manifestation, if you will, uh, of some of that energy. Because even within Port Loop, the buildings are gorgeous. But the reason why that might be starting to feel slightly different from the outside is because it's local people who are, who are driving the social infrastructure with that, within it. Yeah. It's Civic Square at, at the at the barge. It's you know Maya at, at Art House. It's all of the the neighbours who are connecting with that. It's people from the other side of Ignil Port Road that are coming down and grabbing a cup of tea or you know grabbing a bagel. And and it's that social infrastructure mm -hmm. that is what Urban Splash, the developers um, of Port Loop invested in from the beginning it's how do we amplify those social connections so uh, yeah Colette and, and Bob you, you raised something that felt really important there I kind of want to ask in that in that context um what does what does meaningful engagement look like in place making a lot of people don't like the term place making and, and prefer place shaping but what does that look like I think Andre you touched on already the um, engagement isn't enough, but actually a facilitation, a participatory relationship um, being long term. I wonder if you could expand on, on that because time keeps coming up now, like how much time it takes to do yeah. this. 
how much time it takes to build trust to do this. Can you touch on something? I think I mentioned this in um, my spatial imagining um, session a few weeks back. It's that a lot of people can't survive the journey. And if they can't survive the journey, we can't, it's, it's, it's a wrap from there, isn't it? Um, one of the things that I think addresses this point is um, that actually designing and being part of regeneration in the built environment is a technical skill as well as something that requires experience. And because we don't trust our communities enough to give them the opportunity to develop that experience, we're not going to see that change. Um, I want to kind of highlight something that people might be aware of in London where there was reverse volunteering with organisations getting paid for people to look for job opportunities just to grow their their cvs so they can do their jobs we don't want to see that happen in the midlands but it could easily go that way because actually we should be investing in our people in these places that are already doing the work to develop these models because they're on the ground and they're living the life and they're doing the they're doing the work it's not a council mp it's not someone out else out there that's a representative no it's the actual people on the ground that are actually doing this and often a lot of the times resourcing that change themselves um it's not um big big lottery it's not arts council it's not the funders it's the people on the ground that have to manage and administer the grants and actually have to do the work so without giving them the opportunities and having that trust from the private and public sector you can't see the change you can't have it you can't have it both ways it's, it just doesn't work um unless we're just creating cities for set for the few and to be honest that's what we've been doing um i i'll try not to be like i hope this isn't too radical in what i'm about to say but my personal belief is that in the inequity in the city was designed intentionally and we're kind of now designing our way out of it because we realize that actually by creating a space that's not inclusive of these different communities and these different cultures and these different um ways of thinking we've actually put ourselves at a disadvantage, a huge disadvantage. Um, and we've still got policies in place that such um, as allowing huge organizations that hold massive amounts of pro property stock that go vacant, that no one uses to keep sitting on these buildings and accumulate value. And what does that do to the city? It makes it less accessible. It makes it less, less opportunities for people to actually take hold of space and change it. So um, Amara, you might be aware of this. Back in Jamaica and the Caribbean, there is a thing. It's not necessarily something I want to bring here, but I'm just putting it out there. And we call, um, it's um, when you capture land. And that's if somewhere goes unused, someone is, you know that that space may not be available when you go back to that space, because actually someone will take up the space, that space and redefine it and repurpose it. Now, I'm not saying that's the policy we incorporate here, but we need to think of policies that adapt and allow people to take up space in a more um, natural way, um, organic way. Um, but it's facilitated so that it, it, it is part of the bigger strategy in terms of how we define our cities. I, I know in, in terms of capture land, it, it's become, you know, in many ways, people who effectively were stewarding land um, without paperwork, without, you know, deeds, were then vilified, were then made out to be vagrants. And I, I think for me, I'm really interested in, we talk a lot about climate justice. We, we've said it a, a few times today. We talk a lot about green infrastructure. And actually so much of this comes down to our initial relationships with land and space. How in the UK we, 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 we perceive like property as a thing to own and that be the ultimate, you know, that be the goal. And that's how we understand power. And that's how we understand all of these things in relation to land and space um, and it feels as though you know there are some there are some policy things some legal things a heck of a lot of frameworky things we need to work out in order to actually bring about justice in order to actually bring about equity but we might still be in a place where we're debating you know what we actually mean by equity we might still be in a place where we're not actually in alignment with what what the future looks like mm. Yeah, I, th I think there's, um, in, in terms of space uh, and the city centre in particular, I, th I think there's, there's still, there are still barriers. So people in certain communities don't feel as though it's their city centre. So therefore they, they tend to uh, gravitate towards their own communities and the spaces that are, are there. I mean, th th there's probably, uh, I, we did a project a few years ago where uh, a school in, in Small Heath and there were kids uh, who had never been into town 
uh, they'd never had any reason to go into town and and so they didn't even know some of the things that, that happened in town and, uh, until their school started taking them so it, it was um, it was quite an eye-opener uh, to, to see how disengaged certain communities uh, were and, and I'm hope, hoping that will change but um, I think the the idea of ownership of space is an interesting one because I, I think there's been a lot of public space that has been eroded um, and it, and will, will become privately owned even though there might be rights of way across it uh, but you know you try and um, kick, kick a football around Brindley Place or ride, ride a bike through Brindley Place you'll get security um, gathering around you within a few seconds so I, I think I think it's we do need more public space that people can take ownership of and use in their own way, uh, rather than this very sort of controlled way that we see in a lot of these, these private developments. Thank you, Matt. And just sort of come back, I think there's two, two things on what you both said, absolutely fascinating, got me sparked in uh, different ways. I'm just picking up on the, the green space and the, the public space, community space. Isn't that something we recognized in Victorian times that actually we needed that and it was needed for health and for well-being? And here we are, COVID times, and what have we been doing? We've been eating our way through many of those Victorian spaces that, that were laid out for that purpose. So it's almost back to where we started the conversation on that. But the other point that I wanted to pick up, when you're talking about the sort of engaging with communities, and I think that's the question, meaningful, effective. Well, effective, effectively, well, what does effective mean? It means it has the desired outcome. So we have to ask ourselves, well, is the desired outcome when we consult that we want someone to say, wow, you've done a fantastic plan there. I really, really like that. A couple of little minor tweaks here and, and there you are, you're off. Is that what we want? In which case the way we often engage, which is quite superficial, ticks the box, it's effective, or is effective that we actually want communities to get properly engaged and play a part in shaping. And that's where I'd like to be, where they, they really do engage. Now there, we've got to think again about human behavior. People don't like change, that, that's natural. People are stressed when change happens, and many people just want to cling to where they've been. We've also got the problem of those, and it goes across all communities and at all levels of people uh, I describe, and it's not something nice as bullies. They think they know the answer. They don't actually want to listen to the other people around them. They know the answer, their voice is important. And we have to work our way past those blockers and reach the other people. And the minute you do, things start to come out from the woodwork that really are important. So that's one of the, that's another sort of human challenge that we actually have to deal with. It isn't just process, but it, we're working with people and for people. So uh, those were just two things that jumped out from the conversation, which are going in wonderfully disconnected directions, but all coming together in the context of equity. And uh, I think the, um, the biggest mistake that we often make is announcing a public consultation event because I, I think that that's it's such an off-putting concept to most people whereas I, th I think if you do it on, on the basis of trying to understand uh, what what people's everyday life might be and what what they might want to see so, so I mean we, we, we've worked with um, with companies who really think about engagement and and it's not necessarily organizing a, a conventional event or worse still an exhibition of of ideas that have already been crystallized it's actually getting in a very early stage of the process and doing things like a pub quiz or a dinner or, or thing, things that there's no fixed agenda but what you do want to do is to try and understand um what what people are thinking about what what how people might want to see um, spaces shaped or, or projects emerging from, from that opportunity. So uh, it's almost using that engagement uh, to, to inform the brief rather than the design. Because I think more often than not, the, the brief, once the brief is set, the design um, emerges out of that. But really what we should be questioning is what is the brief? Um, and, and even before you write the, the sort of development brief it's it's almost saying to, to the political leaders of the city how, how 
how should this part of the city be evolving? What's the purpose of this part of the city? Um, maybe redundant spaces and buildings have a proper discussion around that. And because uh, there's people who will have engaged with those spaces for years and years and they'll have their own stories to tell and they'll have their own vision of what, what things should be like or what, what could happen there. Absolutely. It reminds me of, um, I know that there was, um, people in the um, Greater Ricknield area, so bits of uh, Summerfield, Winston Green um, and uh, North Edge Baston, put together their own master plan for what the area should be. They didn't wait for the council to come and give um, a master plan for what the area should be. They, they designed one themselves. And now I believe they're in dialogue with, um, with the council um, ab about that. And that kind of feels like in many ways to sort of like shattering this hierarchical approach that we've traditionally taken in, in city planning um, and design. But one of the conversations that we've been having at Maya, you know, we're an arts organization, which often people think all we do is talk about art, but we talk about, we talk about what places should be, we talk about neighborhoods and what resourcing should be. We, um, we've been hosting what we call a developer's dinner, which fundamentally says there are people who are responsible in a traditional sense for the development of place and our neighborhood, um, urban planners, architects, designers, people in the built environment, policy makers, et cetera. But there are also people who are responsible for shaping the development of a place with or without, <laughs> with or without official titles. They are the ones who literally create culture. They create the essence of what the place is. And that is something that a lot of people, a lot of developers know how to extract really well or a lot of, um, you know, we can make really strong narratives out of those things. But in the developer's dinner, you find just how much people have to say about their neighbourhood. You find out that any assumption we've got about not having skills or not having the, the right, you know, all of that gets totally shattered because you see that local people are ready. They've got, they've got master plans, they've got documents, they've got ideas. And a lot of it is about bringing those things together, which needs space to do that. One of the things I, I love that we started talking about, you know, digital infrastructure and part of that being digital poverty, but how people have made digital spaces to do this work how you know digital organizing has taken such a such a strong leap um, and I would love to see like how 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 we resource that but in that I've got um I've got a really I guess it's a slightly tangential question we, we started the conversation speaking about mental health and I personally have like I, I'm zoom fatigued out you know my mental health is my, my mental health is up and down um, and I know that the year of 2020 has um, has strengthened people's feelings about their own mental health, has strengthened experiences, um, has made a lot more people aware of the various impacts of mental health. In the conversation about equity, how are we going to centre mental health and wellness of all people um, for an equitable city? I, I don't think I've got an answer to that one. I think that's one of the most difficult challenges uh, that that we face as as a as society and as a city because it is well. First of all, just understanding the scale of the issue is is an impossible task in itself. But once you do get an appreciation of the the level of harm that this may have done, then how do you actually reverse that, particularly in, in young people um, who who might be who might have relied on school or, or um, their groups of friends to to sort of, um, make their lives meaningful? But then um, that that that's that's something that I don't think I've got an answer for, but it's something that we urgently need to address. I think we've got I've got part of an answer. I, oh, okay. to give, I think it's to give it to artists, <laughs> give the city to artists, give it to creative people because we're able to sit in uncertainty and thrive in it. In fact, we kind of enjoy it. In fact, <laughs> we enjoy it so much that we create places and we create things that give other people um, joy and, and, and create laughter and create spaces and culture that people thrive on. Um, we haven't been doing that. And we actually think about the towns and places in the world that we really enjoy. The creative places that you can go and explore and go on an adventure in so i really personally think we need to make our cities more creative and 
less of this, um, something you said earlier, um, Sue, in terms of really wanting these direct and expected outcomes, that never works. It's, it closes up our minds, our, our minds in terms of what's possible, whereas we're in the opposite space now. We need to be really open because all of this really direct, this should be this way thinking led us to, I feel personally managing COVID really poorly, and now we need to manage that recovery with open minds. Um, so give it to artists, give it to creative people that are going to be able to solve these problems and also sit in them without worrying so much about whether it's the right answer or the wrong answer. Being able to prototype and test new ways of living really comes down to just being creative and, and being open to change. I think that that's really interesting way of looking at it in terms of sort of planning then the issue of mental health has been something that's been exercised in the profession for a while. So at the, about October 2020, there was a guidance note published on planning and mental health, which is really quite help, quite useful in terms of the background. But the key thing that really comes through from that is it's about the quality of the spaces and the places that we live and we inhabit. So the opportunity to get out into the green space that we talked about that we'd lost in COVID, that open space, that's something we have to bring back in. The same in terms of the quality of our housing and the spaces within our housing it's how do you actually plan for that so all of those will have an impact on mental well-being but the issue we've got is an issue today it's not going to wait for us to build all the new houses and the housing stock to be improved so we've got to look in my view for some quick wins and that's where i think this um, the opportunity to green the city to bring nature back into the city. Um, I do work with um, a lot of work with young people through scouting and through Duke of Edinburgh. And what I see is those that often are um, struggling with anxiety or other issues when they're actually out there and looking at nature and you're talking to them, how they change and how that impacts. And that's something that we can start to do and to develop ownership of those places and start to green things up again. So we've got a long-term vision which will improve quality of uh, the infrastructure, but also we've got to do something now. We can't leave it. We have to act now. But in doing the greenness, we'll also be dealing with climate change and hoping to, uh, to bring some benefits there. Thank you so much, Sue. And for me, kind of, I'm, I'm very interested in, of course, green space. And I mean, I got, um, I got my green fingers in Andre led a project in Aston. I feel like that was a couple of years ago now, which is really scary to think of, um, where we literally supported a, a friend to turn um, a, an empty wash yard, an abandoned yard into a green space. And Andre, you've gone on to do extraordinary things um, in Aston that I wonder if you can touch on as well. Okay, um, so yeah, so it has been two years because we've completely lost a year, hasn't we? Haven't we? <laughs> we have. Um, so we started off by just looking at how we can really, like, I think as a group, as a community, we've always been interested in how we can help each other to experiment with, with public space and just open space and kind of break the rules a little bit and work out how we can reshift them or bend them to um, create spaces that we, we really need needed, but also where we could come together and enjoy them. And, and food being that central thing that everybody agrees on, isn't it? Like food, where does our food come from? Um, it's more, it's um, since the pandemic, it's been even more important because actually access to food shifted right at the beginning of the pandemic. We were all worried about um, trade. We were all worried if our supermarkets were gonna have the, um, the things that we needed. Um, and so one of the things we started to turn to was like, how do we kind of resource um, ourselves as, as people just living in our homes, whether it's a flat with no public green space, no garden, or whether it's just um, a house in um, say one of the poorer areas without that public space or those open spaces, where do we grow our food? Where does it come from? Um, can we grow it in spaces where there is no actual land, maybe inside our homes on our balconies? Um, and using technology and architecture to design those solutions and to help people prototype those things in lo-fi, really accessible ways. Um, so for me personally, that began with literally, um, I joke about it now, but <laughs> if you imagine the food tins that things come in and you get your takeaways in the little foil trays, well, if you can clip those together nicely and add a nice light at the top, you've got a little, um, little hydroponics little um, um, container. And if you can create the quite um if you get your old washing up um bo bottles and you start to separate the little things where your oxygen tablets come in and put in some net um some net um net um i can't even think right now 
Um, next, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Basically, you can create the solutions in your home really easy. And actually, with the right education, it's a 30 day cycle to create greens in your home. 30 days. So every 30 days, you can harvest that crop six times before it becomes too bitter for you to want to eat it. And then you can you can compost it. And then you can turn it up, turn it around and plant a new crop and you can continue to do that and you can do that with your children and you can do that with other people so um just touching back on that technology part as well mara um we started organizing the community um whatsapp group around urban farming which happened in the pandemic and um, a lot of people wanting to to change the way that they looked at land and unlock the potential of it um so as well as the grow room that we did in aston which was um supported by amara and with the wash yard and and um, the active well-being society um in terms of providing some funding to, to activate that space um we've also been looking at how we map out the places where we live and find all the kind of nuts and crannies where land has gone unused and come up with little solutions not one big master plan but smaller solutions to those problems and to test them out and so the community WhatsApp group literally resources everybody, whether it's sending seeds, whether it is um, identifying new spaces or new practices of permaculture, whether it's acknowledging things that have been in existence for years, like the barley culture around permaculture, they have a very specific political ecology in the way that they approach um, land, land ownership and land use. And so we're constantly educating ourselves as a community, but we're also organizing as a community to how we look at food provision and land um, as a unit. And that's not government, that's not anyone else involved, that's just communities coming together. Um, we've, I always kind of find it challenging when we say that communities don't have the skills when it's obvious that we're employing the communities, so they must have the skills if they're the workforce. So if they're, we realize in this, in this space that actually there's so much skills available, whether it's from teachers to people that have explored a little bit of science or actual scientists. We found people in the group, as the group grew, um, there was such a plethora of skills that you didn't need to call someone an academic or you didn't have to call someone a professional. Actually, it was just people coming together. Um, and I, I think we need to see more of that happen in the city. And I think it's already happening. I think on that, um, so I, I really appreciate um, the framing of that initially was thinking about wellness and we know that green space and outdoor space and getting our hands messy and all of those things can help to facilitate space where wellness is centred. But I also want to acknowledge two things. One, we know that mental health isn't something to solve. It's something that we live with and lots of people live with, but also that we know that mental health is exacerbated like by lots of other things. And we can't talk about, you know, um, the centering mental health without talking about without talking about poverty, without thinking about, you know, purposeful um, uh, employment, without thinking of all of those things. And I would really love to um, to to ask you one more thing as a as sort of like a, a gorgeous close off of this conversation that we've had, but in all of the things that we've talked about today, um, what should be a priority as we emerge through COVID, as we emerge through all of the impacts that we're experiencing, as we live through many of the things that we knew were there before 2020, what should we be prioritizing in the development of an equitable city? Um, and Colette, I would love if we could come to you first. I think, I guess with my sort of housing development hat on, um, one of the, 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 I guess the kind of key learning points really for, for myself and for the team, and one that we really want to take forward in, in our approach to um, development is the acknowledgement that, um, that there is a huge disparity um, across and within our communities, that we need to take a very uh, micro approach to, um, to uh, our, our approach to development within communities, that we have to be able to um, respond to the, uh, the, 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 the differences within our communities and to embrace them. And also to think about, um, there was something that, um, I've just completely lost my train of thought now, but there was a really good point that I was <laughs> just, I've been mulling over. And I think it's, um, Oh gosh, hang on, come back to me in a minute. <laughs> this happens. This happens after like four hours of Zoom meetings in the morning, doesn't it? You're like, oh, uh. <laughs> you're doing so well. Um, <laughs> shall we come back to you while you simmer on that, Colette? Yeah. Do you know it was it was more about the the approach that we take to engaging with communities, and I think it's about 
our willingness to have very challenging and difficult conversations and not to shy away from those and to be really open about the principles that, that we, we look to set, particularly when we're approaching a regeneration scheme, that those are shared and developed together, that there is not a set of principles that, that we, we agree on and then engage and consult on, that these are principles uh, of, of a regeneration approach that are developed together and are committed to both from, from the city's perspective, uh, perspective, but also from the community, because I don't think we're going to drive lasting change and real change unless it's, it, it is a collaborative and a partnership approach. And I think that's become really obvious um, that, that we don't have the answers, but the communities do, quite simply. <laughs> you know, from, from my point of view, I think the biggest opportunity is decentralization from the city center into the, into the communities uh, and the local centers. Uh, around the city, so, because I, because I think um, a lot of people, as as I was saying earlier, don't have much connection with the city centre. I mean, if you think about some of the communities in East Birmingham, Birmingham out by the airport, that they're, they're they're so disengaged. Whereas I think they they have the same issues and aspirations as as everyone else does. Uh, but it's trying to make sure that uh, through intelligent decisions. And, and proper sort of engagement that, that they don't get forgotten. I think there's a bit of a theme coming here <laughs> because my priority would be equitable, diverse and inclusive community engagement. And that engagement has got to look beyond the, the traditional groups that we engage with that Bob's described, it's actually got to look beyond those that we may then go to next. It's got to look at everybody. And we've got to remember, and this is, is really, really important, that the decisions that are taken now won't just affect us, but they will affect those people who live well beyond us. It'll, they will affect not only our children, but they will affect their grandchildren for generations to come. We've only got to think of the places that we live in now to realise how long that the decisions on development that were put in place three, four hundred years ago, possibly longer, are enduring. We've got a responsibility to plan for everyone. think just on that point as well that um culture is the hardest thing to change it sits beyond beneath every other piece of infrastructure including the built environment right and it's the culture that's got us here so this culture shift needs to happen right away um that's the thing we need to work on um just a touch point because something that comes to mind is in terms of the participation is um, you don't want to feel like you're just in another Zoom meeting with um, the council. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And that's nothing against this because this, this is a really cool meeting. I really like this. Um, but in terms of um, from experience and just sitting on some of the local organized groups and, and how they've operated, they're still a bit archaic in the sense of how they organize. And there's not a lot of people in the community that will take up that space because they just won't enjoy that space. So there are opportunities for people to engage, but the, the structures that exist to hold them and to host it don't really exist to, to, to accommodate these new audiences that exist today. So we do need to redefine what it, yeah, again, what that engagement looks like and, and how that works at a local level. That's what I was alluding to when, it, when I was talking about local politics. It can't just be the same old person that's held the forum for the last 50 years. It needs to be a new, it needs to be a new way of approaching how we talk about our places and our neighborhoods. And I think that's the most glorious way to wrap up a conversation, which has been incredibly rich. I want to thank you all so much for your experience, your insights, your your all of the wonderful things that you've brought to this discussion. So Colette McCann, Sue Manns, Bob Ghosh, Andre Reed, thank you so much for an interesting conversation. Um, and I hope listeners, it has encouraged you all to get involved, to, to get really um, into the engagement process that Birmingham City Council are leading and be as radically honest as you want to be about the proposal that is, um, that is with us. If you haven't already, go and check out our Future City Plan, Shaping Our City Together um, engagement document and have your say on the ideas that are set out there. 
if you think that the city council should be doing something completely different let let them know and um, this is the final week of the formal consultation so please make sure that you have your say um, by clicking on the be heard link in the post and um, completing the survey Birmingham City Council really want to hear from you but more importantly the rest of the city really want to hear from you too so thank you very much and my fellow speakers thank you so much thank you Thank you.